Hey everybody, it's me, Hudson. I am a screenwriter and producer from Atlanta, Georgia, and you are listening to Script Blast, a podcast to help you write better screenplays and write a better life. Real quick, I uh, quick story. I sold the second screenplay I ever wrote to a major studio, but then I struggled for 10 years to break in, and it took me that long to learn what it actually took to create and sustain a successful screenwriting career. Uh, and I, and I want to share some of those lessons with you. In fact, I've created a free online workshop called Blast Off to help you launch and accelerate your screenwriting career. You'll learn how to identify where you are on the journey and get a step-by-step guide to get where you want to be while learning to be happier along the way. You'll get video lessons, workbooks, and bonus resources, and it is completely free. Visit scriptblast.com to sign up today. Today, I got to have a really fun and, and honestly really healing conversation with my good pals, Megan Peterson and Hannah Black. Megan and Hannah are the co-stars, co-writers, co-directors, and co-producers of the feature film Drought, also produced by the Duplass Brothers. After a long three-year journey of starts and stops for Hannah and Megan, Drought was finally ready to go on its festival run when the pandemic hit and all their screenings were canceled. We talk about what it's like to have all your expectations smashed and how to deal with the emotions of creative disappointments. We also explore how to write more clearly defined characters, the importance of having a filmmaking partner, and the power of embracing delusion. Here we go. Let's jump into it with Megan Peterson and Hannah Black. Megan Peterson, Hannah Black. I'm always afraid I'm going to get your last names wrong, like switched with each other. Does that happen it a lot? It doesn't, but sometimes even friends will think one person has had a conversation with the wrong person. It's like <laughs> we are one, essentially. So, Well, so like I, when, when I email you guys, it just goes to drought the movie and uh, I don't know who's responding it's to me. It's both. So we work through that email together but i just see you as one person basically it's kind of true we will say hey i just wrote a draft to hudson will you take a look and tweak it and send it that's how we often <laughs> that's amazing so, so we are recording this during our um coronavirus social distancing time and you guys are separate from each other so as most people see you as one person how difficult is this for you guys to be um to be separated it's really hard. Um, just because, I mean, we are business partners, co-everything, and we're best friends. So, I mean, just like on a personal level, we miss each other quite a bit. Um, yeah. And we are always together. Like, it's uh, well known. We're always together. <laughs> um, so, it's definitely an interesting new way to operate as far as working on drought or other projects. Um, n- new world, man. So uh, to go back, how did you guys first meet? How did you first start collaborating? Um, I know you both uh, have an acting background and still act. Um, So is that is that where you guys first connected? Yes, we were um, both at a studio called Actors Arsenal, and they decided to start a Meisner program. And so Meisner is an acting technique. And we both decided to start acting at the same time. And we met there in that class. It was a two-year program. So we got two years of getting to know each other really well. (laughs) And there were only six people in the whole program. So our whole little tiny team of or group of people, we still all stay in touch. Um, It was super special. I also forgot, I don't think I since there are two people here to specify which one is Hannah and which one is Megan. <laughs> That's a good point. So this is Hannah. Hi, Hannah Black. Gotcha. And I'm Megan. Yeah. yeah Megan Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how did you get, how did you guys get from um, just acting to also writing and directing? So in Meisner um, for the end of each year, our awesome acting coach Ron was Basically, he challenged us, or what we did was we would write a scene, and then we would film it. Um, And so we did that for the end of the first year and really enjoyed it, and then the end of the second year, the final year. And we kind of discovered that we really not only just loved each other's company, but we worked really, really well together. 
And so Megan actually came to me pretty shortly after we graduated with this concept um, that she had for a short film, which would later be if our first thing that we did together um, outside of Meisner. And in that short film, we just, it was one night and it was us and I think a crew of how many, Megan? I think like eight people. Is that yeah. right? By the end of the night, it was only us two and um, our two friends. DP, yeah. <laughs> who was originally not our DP at the beginning of the night. And <laughs> yeah, and then um, also our, our first AD. So it was a small crew, but we loved yeah. working together. Um, and so from that, it just kind of. And were you guys writers at all before um, going through the Meisner class? No, no, um, no. It was, writing for me, at least, was always in school, like my my subject, because I absolutely was horrible at math. <laughs> um, and so I enjoyed writing, but never really even knew that people wrote screenplays or anything like that. So uh, very new for me. And I graduated in biology and psychology. So writing was not a huge part of those programs. Um, but I did discover that I loved to try to figure things out. Um, like I love puzzles and putting things together. And so I think that's how I help out in the writing process more than the actual language or dialogue. That's fascinating. So are you guys kind of two sides of one brain, like one's right brain, one's left brain? Kind of, but at the same time, not. I mean, we definitely are opposites. Um, I'm definitely more like, uh, I don't even know. Megan's very organized. Megan is very able to like think about facts and really able to like get stuff done. And I'm like very, uh, I don't even know, don't, very disorganized. That's not true. <laughs> you get stuff done. Yeah. Well, well, in a, um, yeah, you I don't know. Do. I don't <laughs> even know what I'm saying. We're very opposite, but there are, but we also, um, I don't know. We're somehow on the same page. Yeah. Like every time. It's mm -hmm. very interesting um, working relationship and friendship. I first found out about you guys and we first connected when you were crowdfunding Drought. Um, so tell us a little bit about how that film came about, some of, about that writing process, why you decided to do it, um, and tell us what Drought is all about. Sure. So um, I guess I'll just start with how Drought started and just kind of the process of how we created this story. Um, yeah. Drought started shortly after we made If. We made If in July um, and we started getting into festivals pretty quickly after. We were like, oh my gosh, this is really cool. People want to watch <laughs> our stuff. Like we were just doing it because we wanted to do it. Um, and so we knew that we wanted to continue to create and we were both kind of, you know, mulling things over as creators do in our brain. Like what's the next story that we want to do? I used to be a teacher um, before I found acting and I worked with students on the autism spectrum and still to this day, like I think about them truly every day. Um, I was just really inspired by them. And so I kind of knew that I wanted or and was hoping Megan would too, wanted to do some kind of story that highlighted someone who is on the autism spectrum and really specifically uh, the sibling relationship because that's something that I saw when I was working that was really, it was a really special bond um, that isn't often highlighted. And so one day I was just driving and we live in Wilmington, North Carolina. It's a very, um, uh, hot town in the South. <laughs> um, and so storms <laughs> pop up out of nowhere, um, in the summer, like it'll be sunny and it's like Hawaii almost in a weird way. And so a storm popped up out of nowhere as I, as I was driving and this bag came and it was like twirling around kind of like an American beauty, you know, or whatever. But I was like, Oh my gosh, that looks <laughs> like a tornado. I was like, oh, what if they like, what if one of them was fascinated with weather and they wanted to chase storms and, all this stuff. What if the town was going through a drought? And I like called Megan, I'm pretty sure. And she was like, yes. Um, 
But Megan was like, Han, I think this is bigger than a short film. <laughs> and I was like, I uh-huh. think you're right. So we never written a feature before. And so we read Save the Cat. We looked at all the beats for the beat sheet and kind of figured out what kind of story we were trying to create. Yeah. And what I think was interesting, Hudson, is I think we have watched so many movies Mm. and we've read so many scripts. We instinctually knew the beats of the story before we even read a book on structure um so that was yeah i think that's totally true it's amazing how much you know intuitively just we've we've been told stories our whole lives and we tell stories our whole lives and we just don't realize it until you read a book like that and you're like oh yeah that's exactly how i would tell yeah and we so we used that because we just needed a guide so hannah would come to my house on tuesday nights we'd spend hours Step way too late. It was like we were back in middle school or something. And we yeah. would um, <laughs> part out the beats of the story um, and all the scenes. And then she would go home and every morning write five pages a day. And in three weeks, we had a full script. That was That's crazy. Awesome. <laughs> we couldn't believe yeah. it because we had no clue what we were doing, Hudson. We still don't. Yeah. We know a little bit more now. But- <laughs> It was, uh, we couldn't believe it. Do you think not having any idea what you were doing actually helped you? Because you're doing something so ambitious. You're going to make a movie. You've never even written a, a feature length screenplay before. <laughs> you're just jumping in with both feet and you're just doing it. Like, is there, is there a kind of um, naivete there that helped you get it done? That if you had known what was in store might have gotten in the way. Oh, yeah. 100 billion thousand percent. <laughs> However many percent you can have. And also I think because Megan and I are collaborators, um, just like us feeling so safe with one another with these really like, you know, c- creative thoughts I think are intimate thoughts. They come from your soul. And so having a collaborator who is non-judgmental and – um, can root one another on is also key. Yeah. Like knowing, hey, this like sucks yeah. right now, but just like track with me, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I think that's so incredibly important and so incredibly true. And I think so many writers, when they're on their own, they talk themselves out yes. of stuff, right? They, they, you start doing that negative self-talk of, oh, I don't deserve this. I'm not good enough. And you don't have that other person to balance that out. Right. I know so many times we've been talking and one of us will say, ah, uh, no, that that wouldn't work. And the other person's like, ah, just talk it out. Just like say what it is. Yeah, and then yeah. all of a sudden an idea is birthed out of it. It may not be that exact thought you were having, but um, you can really bounce off of each other. We talk all the time about how we can't, we have so much respect for people who write alone because we don't know how, how to create something without each other. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) It's true. It's so scary to think about that. We have some dear friends that do that. We're like more power to you, man. (laughs) Um, You mentioned your process on drought. You guys would kind of beat out the story together. Hannah would go write the pages and then you'd review and rewrite. Is that still your process of how you, you write to this day? I mean, so we are actually starting a a new story and, um, it's, it's, it's interesting how each story, it's kind of a little different as far as creating the, the idea itself. It's typically the same. Megan and I go on these really long walks and we're just like talking like crazy people about storyline. And usually it's character. Um, it usually starts with like a location and a feeling and, a character. Um, but this next one, like we might do like a co-writing situation um, or, you know, it's, I think it's going to be different for each one, but as far as the beginning process, it's us together really talking about story and character. I'm curious about that. Cause I think a lot of writers struggle with that. What comes first plot or character? And it sounds like it always starts with a character for you guys. Is that always, that character that pops into your mind that starts developing, is it? Uh, does it come out of something personal? Does it come out of like your own life that you've lived? Is there some kind of core where it's like, I have this a character. I want to explore this idea because it's personal to me. Where does where do those characters come from? Yeah, what would you say? That's it's. I think it's a whole mixture. Um, it is. If 
we're if we just be completely transparent and honest, <laughs> even though this is gonna sound very selfish, the very sometimes the first thing we ask I think okay, going back, I think one of the first things we see is kind of a scene or like a, a location, something mm-hmm. is happening. And mm-hmm. then we say, Who would you wanna play in this type of movie? Like what mm-hmm. kind of character would you want to play? Because as Southeast, you mean you you as an actress, right? Yeah, we write roles for yeah. ourselves, even though we yeah. know there's things out there that say try when you're writing not to think of a person for the role. Um, uh-huh. We tried that; it didn't work for us because <laughs> it's so awful. We feel so terrible, but there's not as much motivation because <laughs> we love acting. We love it so much, and so we know at least. If no one else is going to give us a role, we'll create one for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, it's really challenging in the Southeast to get a role that is um, really substantial or meaty. And so, if we're gonna if we're gonna want those and complain about not having them, one of the first things our acting coach said is then write it for yourself. If you're, <laughs> you know, <laughs> change change your situation um, for yourself, and so. We do think about, okay, this time it's not drought, um, so I can play a different character. And what what would be interesting to me to play? And I think it helps in character development as far as starting to look at other human beings and their POV and their um, how they've gotten into a situation they're in. And, and so it's a really fun research into just um, – yeah, the human nature and why we do the things we do. I think there's a really core idea there for writers that aren't actors to look at a script from the perspective of an actor, mm-hmm. right? So someone mm-hmm. who, why would someone want to play this role? What makes a role juicy? Mm-hmm. So talk into that a little bit as an, uh, as, as an actor and what you've, you've learned with your acting background um, what makes a memorable role? What makes a, 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 a great character that every actor would want to play? That's such a good question, Hudson. Um, <laughs> so because Megan and I started off as actors first, I firmly believe, and Megan might feel the same, that all actors are actually writers, especially mm-hmm. because we in the and not to dog on like tiny roles in the Southeast, but that's at least for me and Megan, that's what we usually get. And we're grateful for those auditions, of course, but because of the, I mean, they're very small little three liners or, you know, maybe two pages if you're really lucky. Um, And so because of that, you don't get the full script. You don't even really get a character breakdown. And so you see, this is Melissa and she's 22 and she's a server at a restaurant And you're like, um, how can I create a story for this character that lives in me and feels truthful um, to give her um, some life instead of just, you know, whatever. And so because we were so used to doing that, I think writing a character is essentially like you're an actor and you're writing your backstory. Um, at least in the process that we use for acting is com- is creating completely an entire world and story mm-hmm. for every character, mm-hmm. even if they just say more bacon um, mm-hmm. or if they have <laughs> five pages. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. how small the dialogue. Um, we create the same real human being for each character. And so what that's caused us to do is really have to use our imagination Um, the Meisner technique that we were trained in really has you use imaginary circumstances more than you're going back to memory circumstances. So I think part of acting and, and I teach a beginner's acting class and I have a few writers that are in it and they have, their minds are just like, Oh my gosh, this makes so (laughs) much sense now for going back to write. So I think, If you're a writer out there, taking an acting class or even just talking with actors in their process can really enrich how you go into the writing, writing a character Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and how every character in your script is a real human being. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. That's something that hadn't occurred to me until just now and hearing you talk about it is I remember watching an early cut of, of Drought that you guys sent me mm-hmm. and there were these side characters who might just have one line and I remember thinking, 
oh, that character's so interesting. They must be like coming back later in the oh. film. Or I want to see more of that character. Um, and being honestly a little bit confused because I'm not used to connecting to bit parts. You know what I mean? Normally they're there to give a line and that's it. That's, oh my gosh, that makes me want to cry. That means so much. <laughs> because it's, yeah, I mean, that's real life. Like sometimes you'll talk to the gas station clerk and you'll be like, I don't know why, but this person, like, they didn't even do anything, but I just want to know more about them. And right. because it's a real human being, like they're so multifaceted. And that's the same with a movie, even if they just say one line, they have their own life, you know? Um, and that also... I was going to say, as far as being an actor and writing, it also helps with dialogue. Um, Mm -hmm. Yes. Because as an actor, sometimes you'll get dialogue and you'll, and not to dog on anyone, um, because writing is hard. (laughs) (laughs) Writing dialogue is hard. But as an actor, when you get it, you're like, this feels so unnatural. And our job as actors is to make it feel truthful but the great news is for us since we are actors when we would read through the script we would like be like "Ooh, that um that sounded great in our minds but that does not feel right on um when you say it out loud and so dialogue definitely writing dialogue helps as an actor as well yeah i remember um you guys giving me notes on a, a script that i was producing and one of the notes you gave was all the characters kind of sound the same and have the same voice. And I think this is a problem that a lot of writers struggle with because we tend to write in our own voice, right? So we assign our own voice to every character. What are some tips of really making your characters unique and stand apart from each other um, in the way that they talk and their dialogue, but also in the way that they see the world and have a unique point of view? Oh, I think you're right. This isn't a unique thing um, all yeah. writers struggle with. We struggled with it, um, uh-huh. which was crazy because <clears throat> some two of the characters were going to be us, but we found yeah. that <laughs> our, our drought has four uh, main characters in it. And Sam and Lewis and then Lillian and Carl would often, in those two pairs, would we would find their lines would sometimes sound like the other person. Uh-huh. I think it's being mm-hmm. able to read it with really fresh eyes. Um, and then when you find that, I remember one time we found a line Lillian was saying that sounded like Carl Mm -hmm. and we decided, wait, I don't think we would change the way she speaks. I think that's Carl's line. Like it's just the Uh, wrong character say, saying it. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think, Hannah? How do you, how do you distinguish it? It's so hard. Um, yeah, we're so, I think every writer is, it, especially when you're writing an ensemble cast, it's like bound to happen through the first few drafts. Um, Cause you're still kind of getting to know them and how they operate in the world. And especially when they're close friends, like Sam and Lewis were supposed to be best friends. And so as best friends do, sometimes they sound alike, you know, um, but you don't want them to sound too much alike. So I think um, like Megan said, we would read through it and discover, well, maybe that's actually the other character's line, but also just kind of looking at each character's core motivation mm. in the scene. Like if you just dissect, read through the scene and just say, okay, now I'm just going to dissect how Sam is feeling right now in the scene and her core motivations. And is she, the things that she's saying, are they leading her to her goal at the end of this scene? Um, and if, no, then something needs to change because she's sounding too much like Lewis. I think, I think that's a huge part of it is that you go into each scene Mm -hmm. with uh, however many characters are in the scene, each wanting a different thing. Right. And so when you have a clear goal um, that is defining that character and you put obstacles in the way the characters in my mind become defined by the choices that they make. It's kind of like us in life. Right. Mm -hmm. I always say like, if, if you really want to get to know somebody, you put together a piece of Ikea furniture with them, mm-hmm. right? Because <laughs> you, you, you both have a clear goal. Uh, you're hitting obstacles along the way. You don't, you're missing a screw. You put it on back, right? And so that yes. starts to define us the way that we react to that. Totally. Um, so I, and it's the same with our characters that we're writing. The, the, the more we make them bump into each other uh, with differing goals, they start to define themselves. Did mm-hmm. you ever find yourself in that process of of just um, the characters start talking to you. Like it doesn't feel like you're writing that it feels like they're writing themselves. Totally. 
Yeah, and that's the best feeling in the world. When I think probably in draft four, that's when things really, like I would just look up and be like, oh my gosh, I wrote 10 pages all of a sudden. Um, Because it's like you get to know those characters so well and you feel kind of like a crazy person too when you're writing their dialogue. Um, But yeah, I think around that time is when they really started to... Um, separate in their own unique qualities. It's a, we did a lot of rewrites. <laughs> yeah, they were. We call we call them drafts, but they're actually like re, total rewrites. I don't think we yeah. even kept track of like the edits, the drafts. But um, uh-uh. I think people would find this interesting. From draft, from the very first draft to the last, only one scene stayed the same. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. Everything else changed every time. And that can seem discouraging. But what we found was it was so fascinating because we used things that scenes from draft one were then kind of talked about in the last draft, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So we had written a whole scene at, at a dairy barn. Mm-hmm. Well, a dairy barn is not in our movie anymore, but now those characters have that history. Huh, mm-hmm. that's really cool. Mm-hmm. So, and so they talk about it. And it took going through all those drafts to kind of figure out that history, I'm guessing. Totally. And it was because Megan and I had never done this before. It was kind of like our, like, fil- not film school, but writing school, you know? Um, yeah. I think that's such an important lesson, though, is I'm not sure. And um, as you guys keep writing more scripts, I don't want to be discouraging, but I think it takes that every time. I think it takes yeah. dozens of drafts and you have to be prepared for that. How did you handle that mentally? And how did you know when not to be precious with something, when to protect something? How did you know your changes were making the script better? How did you know you you were ready to film when you were ready to film? Oh, Hudson. How do you know when, how do you know when it's done? We thought it was done um, after those <laughs> first three weeks. We were like, well, let's do this. Yeah. This is awesome. And then a really good friend, um, yeah. Evan and our friend Parrish, they read it. And they um, were so kind to meet with us and say, okay, there's something here. Like you're on to something. But this is not ready. And so I think it takes other people, too, to just level with you and and believe in you. But kindly mm-hmm. say, but not this not yet (laughs) yeah and also the naivety at the beginning was so real (laughs) like we're like yeah we'll shoot this next month um I don't know how we're gonna do that but like now looking back I'm like we had actually no idea um which is good because you know whatever but um it would be hard sometimes for sure there would be some drafts in fact I remember Um, it was draft five and I had written 50 pages and I, um, told Megan cause Megan, I would write it and then I'd be like, Hey, I've written this, read it. And then we would discuss and like figure out changes, all this stuff. And I was like, Hey, I wrote 50 pages. Don't even bother. Like this is going in the can. And I think that (laughs) was a moment where I was like, what are we doing? I don't, I just, we felt so stumped. I think around draft five or six, we didn't know how to. And I think you have like a mistress. I know people talk about this Mm -hmm. a lot, you know, Mm -hmm. about having another project that you kind of stop the one you you're trying to get through and just go have fun on one. And I know Hannah (laughs) has, Mm -hmm. it's terrible to call it that, but (laughs) but it is. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So Hannah has one, a project that she, well, more than one, a couple that she is doing on her own that I think are that just creative release to not have to Mm -hmm. feel the pressure of finishing Mm -hmm. it. I think that's awesome. Mistresses are important. (laughs) <laughs> just, in, just in writing not don't not in real life right, yeah okay, it's not in real life <laughs> so how did you you mentioned being so stumped um was it just getting away from it for a little bit that helped you get over that that hump yeah I mean in that time we were still taking acting classes we were still auditioning and stuff like that um so it was good to have that other especially classes is nice because you have immediate um gratification like you go in you do the scene you watch it and then you're done (laughs) um I honestly don't know 
how we I, was how I just we get through it. We'll just be authentic too. I mean, yeah. we are authentic, but I mean, maybe yeah. too much information. Um, <laughs> yeah, I we'll just say it. we so we were feeling really um, sad about <laughs> life <laughs> and a little bit self indulgent, and went on a walk where we yes. just cried, cried, and said we all we quit. And then yes. I think everything. We quit everything. Really? We quit yes. all acting. We quit acting. Oh, it film. Was so ego dramatic. dramatic. <laughs> um, yeah. But I think everybody gets to that point. I, I've been there dozens of times. Yeah. yeah. But do I really want to do this? It's so much work. It's so personal. It's so devastating. Can I keep doing this? Yeah. Totally. Totally. And we like realize how not life or death our situation is. I mean, right. we have medical professionals in our immediate families uh, that Ooh. actually deal with real life or death. So we're like, oh my gosh, we are being so dramatic. But it is that personal. It does hurt that deep. And so we had that cry walk and then we were like, that was so stupid. Mm-hmm. let's just like <laughs> get over ourselves yes and do the work and it's hard right, yeah. <laughs> right. and then we just kept on going I think <laughs> it's like allow yourself to have a cry walk and just indulge in the cry walk for a second <laughs> and then like brush yourself off and keep on doing the thing yeah, yeah. I love yeah. that yeah. So, um, so let's get to the rest of your story because <laughs> you're talking about all this struggle you had then, oh and I'm like, oh my god, you had no idea what was coming. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Not so, again. so let's talk a little bit about. Okay, you've got a script now. Um, how did you get drought made? Um, and we can talk about your success story too because you have an amazing success story with this, um, with the producers that came on your project and all that. So, kind of tell the story. Well, yeah, sure. I think we were at a point with the script. We really loved where it was. Um, we um, knew it was going to take a lot of money to make it at the scale it was written. And so we had started meeting with people about how to get investors. So not even meeting with investors yet, but meeting with people to help us learn how. <laughs> we someone. met with an yeah. attorney. Like We met with someone who had done it before for their independent film. Because we wanted to play these characters and we're getting older and knew we were either going to have to make this thing happen or shelf it. And so we decided to schedule a short film shoot for one of the scenes so that we could start putting together a pitch package for investors. And that's when Hannah texts me. And all she texts me was uh, this no film school article that said the Duplass brothers want to executive produce your movie. And it had 13 (laughs) exclamation marks. (laughs) 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 And I read the article and I was like, Oh my goodness. We fit this. It was called Hometown Heroes. It was for people that wanted to film in their own town using local cast and crew. And that's what the whole point of our movie was to give opportunities to our hometown. And I was like, Hannah, we need to look into this like for real. And so we looked into it. And what, what, this is when things were like, this was working out (laughs) because we already had the short film shoot ready for the next week. So we had material to put in our, our pitch video for the crowdfunding rally. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And so we entered that wild ride. (laughs) Yeah. And this was on, this is on uh, Seed and Spark, which is a crowdfunding um, website, which we also crowdfunded on and it's how we connected with you guys. Yes. Yes. Um, So yeah, we did, it was through Seed and Spark um, and it happened in August. It was a month long or 30 days. And And what year is um, it? This was in 2017, <laughs> so three years ago, <laughs> um, yeah. which feels weird. Um, and so, yeah, it was crazy. When we entered, there were 73 other um, teams that were competing, and essentially it's whoever had the most followers from for their campaign and also had to raise all of their funds um, for whatever goal they chose. And then the top 10 would be – asked to pitch to the two plus brothers. And so we made it to the finals to pitch. The pitch had to be 30 seconds and no more. 30 seconds. Just (laughs) let that sink in. (laughs) We were like, oh my gosh, how do we do this? Because we love to talk. Um, (laughs) Clearly. So um, yeah, we 
we made the 30 second pitch and we really didn't think we were going to win because we had obviously we had no clue what we were doing. Um, and we just, we just didn't think that it was going to be us, but of course there's that hope, you know, that that's what yeah. keeps you going. But, um, we actually won. <laughs> and so we got a no interest loan from the Duplass brothers. And then we also got executive producership from Mark and JD plus to come on board to make drought. And you guys, you guys got to meet with them and everything too. Um, we mostly yeah. work with Mark. Um, Jay is uh, spend spending time. He kind of took a career path change and went from producership to acting. So he's mm-hmm. been really focused on a lot of acting. Um, uh-huh. So Mark and a couple of people from Duplass Brothers came on board. Uh, we had a meeting, like a FaceTime meeting, since we're by coast. We're not by yeah. coastal. We live on the East right. Coast. Yeah. They live on the West Coast. Um, yeah. We had a like a FaceTime meeting, and then since then we've really been communicating a lot of her email. I think the, they've been helpful throughout the entire yeah. process, but the most help they gave us was right at that beginning with mm-hmm. the script. So yet mm-hmm. again, another rewrite. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was the most critical rewrite because he, we won't, we learned, we learned something else from being new. We'll, we won't shout out our budget because we're going right. into the distribution process right now, right. <laughs> but it was very right. small. That's no secret. Um, and he's like, guys, the script is like full of humor. It handles a really um, important topic very gracefully, but you need a lot of money to shoot it. Yeah. Um, we're like, we know. <laughs> <laughs> so their, their notes were a lot of getting your budget down. Yeah. And the, Actually, the notes. That- yeah. Well, like getting budget down in the writing process. Right, right. Um, What's the heart of the story is what he kept saying. Like, what is the story about? And if anything in the script is not about that, cut it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. And the notes that he gave, gosh, like, because as writers, getting notes is brutal sometimes. It's, it hurts. Um, Not always. But he was so, him and his team, they were so kind when they delivered the notes. I mean, my gosh, it was the kindest, the kindest. Basically, he was like, hey, like, you guys can take it or leave it. You know, this is, you know, your project. This is what we're thinking. Take time to digest, be angry, be mad, be whatever, pretty much. And, um, but the notes that they gave were really, really good. And Hudson, I think there's something in there that goes back to a question you had earlier, which is they did have one note about taking a character out, like cutting a character. And that was one of the notes we were like, hold up. No, like if we take (laughs) him out, all this, it it just, it's not the vision anymore. And so we just had a phone call about, can you explain why you would cut this character um, and when the reason was given that, then we could just change the character a little bit, like change the backstory gotcha. for him. Like the relationship with yeah. him, with other characters. Right. And keep- but you guys were able to fight for that and you knew that that was important to your story. Yep. So right. I think you just know, like you mm-hmm. don't want to let go of some of the other things. Like Hannah said, you'll get the notes and you'll be mad about it. But then you realize, oh, they're right. They're right. And then you're like, wait a second. And if you're ever, after a few days of getting notes, if you ever stop and think, wait a second, then I think it's something <laughs> to examine. <laughs> yeah, I think that's and great. Asking, asking what, like the person that gave those notes, I think, because Megan's really good about this, because um, I'll just be like, ah, I don't want to get rid of this character. And basically, <laughs> I, I can't even get past yeah. like that. I'm just like, why? And uh, <laughs> Megan's like, wait let's ask why, like why, what about this character makes him want to ax him? And I think asking those questions is really, really important because, because we asked that question, we were able to tweak some things about this character and his relationship with other characters. And it made it 100 times better. Yeah. Um, and the story more interesting. Whereas instead of just being like, no, we're keeping them or, okay, we're getting rid of them. Um, so asking those questions has been really critical. 
and really having the humility to uh, to ask that question, what's going to serve the story the best? What's going to serve the movie the best? Mm-hmm. And being able to step back from it's not just because you love it; it actually is. Um, it makes the movie better to t- to take these notes or to integrate them in that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Totally. <clears throat> all right, so let's fast forward. So you guys, uh, I mean, there's all this amazing stuff in your story that you made your movie. Um, you you uh, went through the process. You did another crowdfunding campaign for Post. Is that right? Correct. <clears throat> Which was another incredibly successful campaign. You, it's all ready to get out into the world. You guys get into three festivals in one weekend, and then what happened? <laughs> well... Then what happens is um, what has happened to every filmmaker that was set for a 2020 festival run Um, and COVID-19, the coronavirus hit. And so now we're currently, along with all other filmmakers and film festivals, trying to navigate this new normal for right now. Uh, What is next? Um, Yeah which has been very devastating for so many reasons. I mean, for humanity, everyone's, you know, dealing with a pandemic. Um, yeah. But then personally for us, just as far as film world goes, and all filmmakers are experiencing this, you've poured your heart and soul into making this thing. And then you're like, I don't know if people are going to be able to see it. Like together in a, in a, group of in a theater or whatever right which is the goal i mean like that's when you make when you're on set when you're writing that's what you're looking towards right is watching it with a crowd in a room hearing people react to it that's the dream right totally so so i've been texting with you guys through this time because it's been hard on me as well we were about to distribute our film for the first time and and have some of those uh theatrical experiences um and the thing that i said to you guys is it feels selfish a lot of times uh, because there's so many people dealing with such bigger issues than just people not being able to see their movie. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how you've dealt with those feelings? Because I know every artist in the world is feeling that right now, that kind of like they're, majorly depressed but they have a little bit of guilt about that depression because should they really be depressed? Like how are you guys navigating all of those emotions right now? I think number one is when we identified it as grief, that yeah. that was so helpful because um, then you don't fight it as much. You can just let yourself grieve, um, even though it's a grief for something not tangible. Um, it's still real. And, mm-hmm. and that in your mentally and I think even like physically in your body doesn't know it's not um, for something – you know, as, as crazy as what some people are going through, um, mm-hmm. you still have to go through that process of um, grieving what expectations you had or dreams you had. And then I don't know where I was going with that. I'm, I'm in the in the zone of now thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's right. grief allowing yourself to to like feel the feelings and know that I think it's just constantly reminding at least myself that the feelings that I have are valid. The real feelings that are okay to feel. Mm. Um, and you know, I think it's okay for me, at least I've got to hold on to some hope because I'm just, I can't, I can't function if I don't, you know, have a little glimmer of hope, but I will say for us, um, we have not dealt with a pandemic before, but when we are in the middle of shooting our film, uh, Hurricane Florence hit our town. Right, right. And at that time, um, we had five more days left to film and we had to stop. And being a small budget movie, a low budget film, it was like, oh my gosh, like, what are we going to do? And because Florence really wrecked our town. I'm in fact, my neighbor next door still has a tarp on his roof. Wow. Um, And let's talk about the irony real quick that your movie is about a group of people looking for a storm and then the storm storm comes. Yeah, totally. And so (laughs) what we experienced there was when we had to pause, we did not know when we were, if we were going to finish this movie, um, just because of how much damage there was in our town. And we still had to right. shoot in our town, you know? Yeah. Um, 
and, you know, just financially. And so at that time, it felt similar in this time to like, how are we going to get to that next step? How, cause we can't see it. But during that time we wrote another scene for our film and it made the movie so much better. And so oh, I'm wow. just, yeah. And so, and it was awful. Florence was awful. Um, and this, what's happening, it's like a whole other level of, it's a worldwide, you know, tragedy. Yeah. Um, but I'm holding on to the hope that during the, something is going to work out <laughs> just like it did. For, it's just gotta. Right. <laughs> um, and so, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I guess just saying like there, there's got to be a silver lining in something. That's what I'm just looking for yeah. to help me cope. Yeah. yeah, I think we've, uh, yeah, we've had that. We've had health issues. We've had death in the family during production. Like we've gone every wow. film. Every film goes through some pretty tragic things or tough circumstances. We kind of had our fair share in the 18 days of shooting of yeah. really tough situations. Yeah. Um, so I think it's caused this resilience in us, not to say that we are always like, yeah, it's going to happen, but right. it, we, we're like, we've been through some pretty awful mm -hmm. things and made it through the other side with a great movie. And mm -hmm. so it can, something still good can come of, of all of this. Um, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of themes that have gone through this conversation and it's made me realize why uh, I connect to you guys so much is because I very much feel those themes in my own life. One of them is just this idea of delusion, right? Of like, of thinking that everything's going to be okay. <laughs> and maybe delusion is the wrong word. Brian, Brian Koppelman uses this quote where he says, um, the, the line between delusion and success is... Uh, like almost this invisible line uh -huh. and, totally. and, and, and you're delusional up until you're successful. But this idea of, and, and maybe you can call that delusion hope, you know, I mean, that's kind of a, a nicer yes. word to put on it. Um, <laughs> I, I feel that very much in my own life of um, I'm just going to move forward and no matter what obstacles coming in my way, I'm going to keep going. And look for both of us, this could all end in a train wreck, but we're going to keep going and we're going to keep pushing for that hope and believing in it. And I think that's a very powerful thing. And I think, that's what all successful filmmakers have in common is that they're able to push through and able to be delusional, delusional a little bit. Um, the other thing with you guys is the fact that you have each other. Mm -hmm. um, I think all that all mm -hmm. makes all the difference in the world. And I have that same relationship with Jordan who directs um, our stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That there is always someone there when you're ready to give up to say, Hey, we're going to keep doing this. Uh, when one person is down, the other one can be up and vice versa. Uh, that I think is really important for for writers or filmmakers to find that person who can be their champion and who can be their partner throughout uh, this journey. Because it, as you've heard in your story and my story is very similar, you are going to face every single obstacle possible and it's going to be painful. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to take um, those two things to get you through it. Yeah, it's um, there's no way in the world that we could have done this without one another. I don't know how people were. So I think, um, we have learned it's just, you know, at the beginning of this journey, I knew I was so grateful for Megan, but after we've been through literally like kind of every tragic life event <laughs> that could have happened, um, yeah. it's like the gratitude that I have for her is, I'll get emotional. It's out of this world. Oh. Like we, I could not do it without her. So yeah. I, um, I hope and pray that everyone who's a artist or creative finds their Megan, you know, right. or their Jordan, you know, right, um, it's yeah. so important to keep you going. Yeah. That's awesome. And yeah. Oh, thank you, man. I feel this thing. <laughs> and you do. You take time to share the delusion. I remember the yeah. night that we had to make the call. <laughs> I was yeah. feeling the delusion phase, which is really interesting because I'm more the I'm typically more the practical. Like a hurricane mm -hmm. is coming. We need to stop. <laughs> Um, but I was right. not. I was like, we are getting this movie in the can. <laughs> right, um, yeah. And and the ice cream truck had broken down. Like the brakes mm -hmm. weren't working. The storm was coming. Our crew was incredibly stressed out because they needed to go home and like get their house right. together. And Hannah and our first AD just came to me and were like, hey, Megan, 
I think it's time that we just stop. And so I think it's like a person, you need that person that has the ability to speak like that to you as well, like to give you hope, but also to like say, hey, we we need to pause for a second. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's what Hannah has been so amazing um, for me. And it's so Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So uh, we wrap up the podcast with five questions. So I'm going to ask you five quick questions. Just answer off the top of your head. You guys both get to answer, Ooh, or you can answer okay. for each other even. Oh Ooh. my gosh. Right. Okay. <laughs> That'd be fun. So first, first question is, uh, what do you write? Megan, you go first. Am I speaking for you or for me? Oh, um, we write jointly. Yeah. Um, I think I, oh, my phone fell I, I think um I think what we write what we strive to write is something that is truthful and authentic and full of heart and comedic and southern uh, and southern that's awesome yeah <clears throat> what's your what's your proudest accomplishment making drought <laughs> <laughs> yes do, do you do you assign a moment to that like what is the What is your like moment of pride? Is it like being on set the last day? Is it seeing the first cut? What, what, what is the one moment that you look to? I know for me and I'm so lucky, uh, or I'm so grateful. Our behind the scenes guy actually captured a picture of it. We didn't know, but as soon as we wrapped the movie and everyone, like finally after the hurricane and everything and, I just remember Megan and I were standing by the ice cream truck and our crew had started packing things up and I was just looking and I was like, oh my gosh, we all did this and we all went through some crazy stuff. And Megan and I just got to hug. Megan's not a hugger, so (laughs) I got a hug from Megan. I think just like that moment where it was us two just watching our amazing team, you know, packing up and we just all together made this amazing thing. That's me. Megan? Probably in eighth grade when I won the soil and conservation <laughs> essay contest. <laughs> that set the bar high. I still have the trophy in my office. Dang it. That one's awesome. good. That one's good. <laughs> you know Shit. it's drought. You know. Um, how do you define success? Um, when you keep on going, regardless mm. of results. That's me. <laughs> that is great. That's, that's what I think. <laughs> I really like that. I'm like struggling on questions. Same answer. Same, I'll just keep saying same answer. Yeah, I mean, same. I'm on the same page. So. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, when you finish what you started. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or willing to. Yeah. When you finish what you started. No matter what. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the hard part with that is like, what is finish, right? Like, right. That's what there's, there's all there's always another level. That's why I paused there because I was like, oh, hey, or if you know when yeah. to stop, is that? <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what writers do you look up to and why? Oh, good question. Um, I will say writers. Oh, I was just going to say, I love John August. I love his podcast script notes. Mm, yeah. And Big Fish is my favorite movie. And so uh, I think his, I just love how he wrote that script. So whimsical, but so touching. If I could write a script like that, be my dream. That's a good one. And what about you, mm. Hannah? That's good. Um, there's a lot that I look up to as far as like writers specifically go. For some reason, Jason Reitman came into my brain right now because I just love, um, uh, he writes with humor and realism. Yeah. I like his work. Um, and Shakespeare, is that new? Um, oh, I know. I know. Uh, Tracy Letts. My gosh. Who's Tracy, Tracy Letts? Letts? What about the playwright? Uh, August. Oh my gosh, and Alan <laughs> Ball, who I'm so lucky I got to collaborate with him last summer. Um, and right now, Megan and I are doing five women wearing the same dress. We're doing like a virtual yeah. play um, with three of our other friends, acting friends. And yes, Alan awesome. Ball. Gosh, he's such a great writer, 
Southern humor, realism, really interesting characters. Alan Ball. <laughs> That's the answer. Good answers. Um, finally, what advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, gosh. Oh. I'm trying to fill up dead air. <laughs> <laughs> Another another way to phrase that might be what advice would you give to someone where you were, you know, three or four years ago? They're just starting out. They don't know what they're doing. They feel all that delusion on their shoulders. What, what advice would you give to them? I would say stay delusional. Um, don't let people yeah. say you can't do it. I also think that's a motivator yeah. for us that we don't realize. Is if mm-hmm. I don't know if people are like, Okay, you're going to make a feature? A whole movie? <laughs> and it, mm-hmm. So I think that is yeah. a few, I say use that as fuel um, and don't be discouraged if people doubt you. It doesn't right. matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think knowing that it's okay that you don't know everything. Um, that's something that I struggle with when we were creating drought, especially on set with all the hats that we are wearing. Um, I rig- oh, I don't know technology. I don't know gear. Um, so that was something that I really struggled with. So looking back, I think it's okay to not know everything. Yeah. Um, it's okay. <clears throat> That's awesome. So, um, all right. So people want to follow up and see what you guys are doing next. They want to find out when drought's finally available and when they can see it. How do, how do they keep in touch with you guys? <laughs> uh, well, everything is drought the movie. So, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, it's drought the movie. Um, our email is drought the movie at gmail.com. We clearly share an email. So if you want to get in touch with us there, um, also we'll do updates on Seed and Spark. And, uh, if you go follow us on Seed and Spark is seedandspark.com slash fund slash drought. Um, and we'll send out little newsletters there every now and then. Um, but yeah. Very cool. And one of the best ways you can help, uh, filmmakers that are on Seed and Spark is just, it's free to just click follow. Um, and they're able to stay in touch with you and the value that a filmmaker gets from that is, um, is invaluable. All right, cool. Well, thank you guys so much. This was really fun and, um, surprisingly touching. And, um, I felt, I felt like I learned a lot and, and feel validated just in my feelings. I feel like I've been through a therapy session. (laughs) Oh, great. Us too. I mean, I shouldn't speak for Megan, but I think us too. (laughs) We had so much fun talking with you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Hudson. Talk to you soon. Big thanks to Megan and Hannah for the conversation, and thanks to you guys for listening. If you're looking for some direction on your screenwriting journey that you find yourself on, I'd love for you to check out Blast Off, our free one-hour workshop to help you launch and accelerate your screenwriting career. You can sign up at scriptblast.com for free. If you're listening and thinking, man, you know what? I really like the vibe of this podcast. Where can I find some more screenwriters who are actually supportive of each other and have a positive attitude about this whole journey? You can find us over in our community on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash scriptblast. And finally, uh, you can reach out to me personally at hudson at scriptblast.com. Look forward to sharing with you guys next time. Thanks a bunch. Have a good one. Bye.